I'm Dave Stouffer, and this is JC's World, a reading from a novel I wrote entitled The Reverend Mr. JC, When Appearances Are Not Enough. Our friend, the Reverend Mr. JC, thought he was doing pretty well as a minister. He thought an impressive plea for forgiveness from the pulpit would satisfy parishioners complaining that he did very little at all. Suddenly, he found his wife siding with his bishop in a move that separated them while he endured a pastoral boot camp under crusty old Pastor James in Prophetstown. It was not only physical work during those first months in Prophetstown. New ground was broken in the field of ministerial endeavor. J.C. had always been reluctant to visit people in their homes. He had the idea if you were going to visit with members of your church, the time to do it was Sunday morning before or after service. He knew other ministers went door to door as he thought of it. Since he didn't consider himself a brush or Bible salesman, he just didn't do that. J.C. outlined his philosophy and James, true to his nature, did not try to change J.C.'s mind or force his hand. But one morning in September, when J.C. came downstairs for breakfast, he said, John, I need a favor today. What is it? J.C. asked cautiously. Harriet Peckham has been in the hospital. She's having some vision problems that aren't quite fixed yet. When I asked how she was doing, she said, I miss reading my Bible. That's when I thought of you, John. With that beautiful voice of yours and the style you have when you read the scriptures, I thought I'd ask you to go and read Miss Harriet some scripture. You can't be serious about wanting me to go to her house alone and just read the Bible? John, you don't have to try to convert her. She's already a Christian. You don't have to try to get her to come to church. She already does. She's just having trouble seeing, and I'm asking you to do this as a favor. So I just take the Bible and go over there and stay for half an hour? James said, half an hour will be fine. Well, I guess I can do that. It took J.C. half an hour to decide what to wear. He finally settled on gray wool slacks with the blue blazer and the light blue shirt. He had four or five neckties on and off before he decided perhaps that looked too formal and finally did not wear a tie. At Miss Harriet's house, the doorbell was immediately answered by an older woman who appeared to be in the pink of health with excellent eyesight. This is 309 Spruce? Miss Harriet Peckham's house? You must be Reverend Leslie. I'm Dorothea Smith, Miss Harriet's neighbor. She's been talking about this morning for several days, which was J.C.'s first inkling that there might have been something premeditated between James and Harriet concerning this visit. You just come right in, young man. Harriet and the girls are in the living room. Harriet and the girls? The girls turned out to be three more of Miss Harriet's neighbors, and they were introduced as Rosie Tussaud, Belle Farrell, and Ivy Curley. J.C. stood in the doorway of the living room, seeing all five ladies dressed in their Sunday best with looks of wide-eyed anticipation. Miss Harriet turned toward J.C. Oh, Reverend, you have no idea how much I have looked forward to this. I have listened to you read the scripture and lead the worship service, and it sounded so beautiful. I just had to share you with my friends. I hope you don't mind. There immediately came to J.C.'s mind a multitude of reasons as to why he could not, should not, would not be there. He opened his mouth to let them come out, but before he uttered a word, Miss Harriet said, Reverend, I, I put this chair over here next to the window so you could have good light, and I asked that a glass of water be put there for you. We're just so blessed that you're here. Thank you, thank you. J.C.'s lips slammed shut, halting the float of the unspoken excuses, and when he could trust himself to speak, said, I'll do my best, Miss Harriet, and took his chair. He had spent some time marking a few scriptures. He was not familiar enough with the Bible to trust himself just to find them. He opened with everybody's favorite, the 23rd Psalm. He took a drink of water, cleared his throat a couple of times, and read it. He finished 
to silence. And when he looked up, he found the looks of anticipation on the ladies' faces had faded into happiness. Eyes were crinkled, lips formed involuntary smiles. J.C. segued into 1 Corinthians 13, another perennial chestnut. He'd read it over the years at weddings. As he finished, there were exclamations of awe and joy. One lady took her handkerchief and dried the corners of her eyes. J.C. was encouraged to read another one, and then another. Finally, he ran out of torn bits of paper that marked the scriptures he'd selected. He looked at the clock on the living room wall and saw 40 minutes had passed. Well, he thought, I've given James 10 minutes more than he asked for. He was thinking of graceful ways to take his leave when Mrs. Farrell said, Reverend Wesley, I'm from the Congregational Church, and I really do love the Psalms. I know you read the 23rd Psalm, but are there some others that we'd enjoy? They, they're so beautiful. J.C. remembered hearing that the word Psalm actually meant hymn or song, so he mentioned that. And he thought the Psalms, for the most part, had been written by King David, so he said that too. If the women already knew that, they didn't let on, and they, they seemed to soak up his words as though he were a visiting professor. Well, this was going pretty well, thought J.C. So he read a couple more psalms, and emboldened by his success, he asked if there were any questions, that maybe they could have a discussion. The ladies sat quiet. Finally, Mrs. Tissot half raised her hand for J.C.'s attention and said, Reverend, this might be a stupid question. J.C. used one of his stock lines. There is no such thing as a stupid question, Mrs. Tissot. There was no warning of the explosion that was about to take place among the five older ladies and the young minister. Mrs. Tissot said, I don't understand why there are so many different churches. All of us have lived in the same neighborhood most of our married lives. Our kids played together. They did everything but go to church together. The five of us have gotten together pretty much every week or so for coffee for years. Why is it that we all worship God and try to follow the teachings of Jesus, and yet we are Congregationalists, Methodists, Roman Catholics, and Trinity Church people? Why is that necessary? The bomb had burst, with its shrapnel of words shattered around the living room. Each woman added her voice. Yes, why? Can you explain that, Reverend? What is the story? J.C.'s mind was churning. Come on, brain. You always have so many ideas. Don't fail me now. I don't care how old James Edwards is. I'm going to take him out to the garage and whip him. And those and a million other thoughts crowded their negative way into J.C.'s brain. He attempted to buy some time by asking a question. So if I understand what you're saying, Mrs. Tissot, instead of having all these different denominations or groups of people, churches, there would just be one church? Yes, Reverend, yes, a community of believers. Miss Harriet spoke up. I guess, Reverend Wesley, none of us much care about the books and papers that are put out by our separate denominations that tell us what they think we should believe or how we should run our church fellowships. It seems to me, Reverend Wesley, that if we all took a good look every day at those Ten Commandments and then remembered how Jesus treated all the people, no matter what their status in the world, that's pretty much all we'd need. Now, I know we've put you on a spot here, Reverend Wesley, and considering that you are a minister of one of those denominations, it's not really fair to ask you that question. Well, I guess I would like to have a little time to think about uh, and pray uh, about how to answer that. Well, we can meet here again, said Mrs. Tissot, a week from today at the same time. Is that okay with you, Harriet? That would be wonderful, said Harriet, but I'm sure Reverend Wesley has more things to do than spend one morning every week with us old ladies an out. He was being given an out. It was a huge, slow-moving pitch that he had to hit. He would take that out. He would take it. He would rise from this chair. He would bid everyone a good day and be out of there. Instead, 
he heard himself say, A week from this morning, at 10.30, I believe I'm free. J.C. hadn't felt like this since his days in high school and college theater. He enjoyed the appreciation of his reading skills, and as a person with more than just a little ham bone in him, he swelled to their compliments. And then there were the treats, cookies, scones, even a fresh baked rhubarb pie. There was a meeting the following Wednesday morning, and the question was discussed. With J.C. admitting he didn't have an answer, but perhaps they could find one together. J.C. was to learn the answer to that question eventually further down the road. But for now, he continued to read scriptures to the ladies with the occasional poem thrown in. And they continued to meet every week through that winter, and J.C. never took James to task for sending him to Harriet Peckham's house. J.C.'s changes become evident to him when he tries to step back into his own life for an afternoon. With his golf bag in the back of the minivan and his golf shoes neatly shined and lined up next to them, J.C. in his powder blue polyester pants with the matching striped shirt climbed into the car ready to head out for a heavenly afternoon, hitting the ball, lunch at the club, talking with his buddies. As always, when he drove into the Pine Grove Country Club, J.C. marveled at how beautiful the place was. The membership fees were a lot, but what they bought. Though October had turned the trees bright red and yellow, the greens and immaculately mowed fairways were bright emerald, the sun glinting off the water hazards. This was how life should be lived. This wasn't Prophetstown. This wasn't the struggling church. This is where I should be. Boy, it was good to see the guys. Chris Morris, the financial advisor, Charlie Jones, number two man at the funeral home, and Tommy Tucker, who had sold him the Ford, clean fingernails, the latest golfing equipment, all with fresh haircuts and shaves. Oh, this is the way life ought to be. One by one, each stuck out a hand to shake with J.C., told him how good he looked. Have you dropped a few pounds, J.C.? Looks like those pants fit looser, Chris observed. I, uh, well, work a lot around the church, I guess, J.C. smiled. Well, yes, well, you'll have to tell us about that, Chris said. A lot of that work must be outside, Tom said. You've got quite a tan going. Yeah, there's quite a bit that has to be done there, J.C. started when Chris cut in. I see our table's ready. The guys remembered to reserve the big glass table in the center. What a view of the first tee. As the waitress brought water with plenty of ice and lemon wedges, the guys joked about how good it was to have J.C. back with them and how they were ready to take some of his money. Wink, wink. J.C. basked in the attention. This was just like the old days, and it brought back how great it had been to play golf weekly, eat the big sandwiches, and discuss what was going on around town. J.C. loved it. But he had nothing to add. He couldn't think of any gossipy stories from Prophetstown, at least nothing he cared to share. He couldn't tell them about pulling 20 years of accumulated slime out of Kitty's gutters. And he couldn't tell them he'd spent two days last week shingling a roof. The stories he knew from the church, its prayer groups and Bible studies, all seemed really important when he was in Prophetstown, but they didn't stack up against the town gossip the guys were sharing. They weren't the same category. And J.C. noticed that the promise to return to the conversation about what he was doing never materialized. He loved these guys. He'd spent years getting to know them. But now something was different. J.C. hadn't played since he'd left for Prophetstown four months ago. He thought he'd be rusty. Let's hit a bucket of balls, somebody suggested. We got all afternoon. As J.C. hit, he felt his swing returning. He seemed to be hitting the ball harder, and he wasn't breathing as hard. It seemed easier to see over his stomach at the ball on the ground. He had changed physically with all that work and eating plain food, thought J.C. with some surprise. 
but the big surprise didn't happen until the first tee. J.C. was nervous, so he deferred to the other three. They were still playing every week. They each hit pretty fair shots, a respectable distance down the fairway. They teased J.C. Maybe he'd like to use the woman's tee since he was so out of shape. We'll see about out of shape, said J.C. as he bent to place his ball on the tee. His shoulders felt pretty loose and it felt smooth and good to swing. There was a satisfying thwack as he hit the ball. The others kidding went to silence as J.C.'s ball dropped yards beyond where theirs had landed. Chris turned to J.C. You better back off, pal. Your shoulders are going to hurt tomorrow the way you're so out of shape. J.C. said, I spent two whole afternoons last week with a weed cutter. That's a lot like a golf swing. You what? I knocked down a field of weeds. J.C., that's why there are mowers. We don't have a mower, though, and it needed to be done. Just swing the cutter back and forth. You get to thinking about things. You get to cutting off your toes if you don't pay attention. No, Chris, you don't. You unconsciously get into a rhythm, and besides, you wear steel-toed boots when you... What? The man with the most perfectly shined wingtips I ever saw is telling me he now wears steel-toed boots? Yeah, Chris. Blue jeans and work shirts, that's what I wear most every day. Correct me if I'm wrong, but didn't you leave here four months ago to go to Prophetstown to be pastor of the Trinity Church? Yes, I did. So when you get up in the morning to go to your office to a church that's big enough to require two ministers, you put on blue jeans? J.C. was enjoying Chris's amazement. A couple of holes later, J.C. found himself walking down the fairway with Charlie. Hey, J.C., Chris tells me he thinks you're nuts. Charlie was the most outspoken of the group. Flipped out. Weird. What's the deal with the shoes, steel told, and the pants? Blue jeans, Charlie. You probably have some. Well, yeah, I wear them to, well, you know, wash the car, mow the yard. Or if Janet wants me to do fix-up work around the house, is that what you're talking about? Charlie, I'm still a minister. I'm the second pastor of the Trinity Church in Prophetstown. But it isn't like the Trinity Church here in Pine Grove. It's different. We don't talk about doing things for other people. We do them. We don't wait for somebody to come to the church and ask for help. We're, we're what's the word now? We're pro proactive. Charlie scratched his head. J.C., it was all we could do to get you out of your book-lined office to play golf once a week when you were here. I know, Charlie. You know, at first I wanted to sit in the office at Prophetstown, too. J.C. didn't try to explain that his office was a bedroom in the parsonage. There was too much about the Prophetstown experience that was too hard to explain. But James, who's James? James Edwards. He's a senior pastor. He explained the first day I was there that I need some work clothes because part of our jobs was to serve the physical needs of the congregation. Handyman kind of things. Cleaning out gutters. J.C., I hope you said no. You're a minister, not a servant. Yep, that's what I told James, and he asked me how familiar I was with the Gospel of Matthew. It says we are supposed to be servants to each other. James said that's what God sent Jesus to teach us. But cleaning out gutters? Yes, cleaning gutters. I did it. I was pretty mad, but I was stuck. Someday, Charlie, I'll tell you about how and why I moved to Prophetstown. By this time, they had both putted and all four men moved on to the next tee. By the end of the afternoon, all three of his friends had talked to J.C. individually and asked their own questions and shared their own trouble in believing or understanding what was going on. As they headed back, Chris said, we're stopping at the clubhouse for a drink. You want to come, J.C.? No, it's quite a drive back to Prophetstown. Thanks, though. Charlie said, J.C., you're welcome at any time, but you need to be thinking about what you're doing over there. You need to be preaching every Sunday. 
I'm not much for church, but I've heard you preach. The sermon you did Christmas Eve a couple of years ago, that put tears in my eyes. It was so good. It was so theatrical. Chris says, I'm not one for Bible study, but there's one part I've heard about hiding your light under a basket. And it seems like that's what you're doing, JC. Doing dishes and cleaning gutters, trimming weeds. That's not you. JC decided to detour out of his way to stop in Van Buren and see Ruth. It was only one more hour's drive and he could still be home before bedtime. He pulled up in front of his in-law's home, sure that Ruth would be pleased to see him. After all, he had driven quite a distance to see her. Ruth answered the door. The sweet, loving wife his mind pictured was replaced by reality. What are, you, what are you doing here? She seemed startled, not pleased. Caught off guard, J.C. blurted out the truth. I had an invitation to Pine Grove today to play golf, and I thought you'd changed. But here you are, sneaking off to play golf in your fancy clothes with your fancy friends. But Ruth, don't but Ruth me. I thought things were different in Prophetstown, and I thought you were too, but you haven't changed. J.C. felt like he'd been slapped. Ruth wasn't being fair. But he had his orders from the bishop, don't talk about your ministry. He wouldn't even try to explain today's golf game had been James' suggestion. I guess I've caught you at a bad time, Ruth. I'll, I'll call on Friday. Silence from the front porch until the door was closed, none too softly. That's today's reading from the Reverend Mr. J.C., when appearances are not enough. Thanks for listening. See you next time. I'm Dave Stouffer.